Welcome to the Beyond 3D podcast, where we explore all things 3D and the important role that 3D data plays throughout the manufacturing process, driving decisions throughout a product's life cycle. Here, we talk with industry analysts, business owners, developers, and industry influencers, and hear real stories that you can relate to and learn from, and know which trends and technologies apply to your business. So join us as we go Beyond 3D. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Beyond 3D. In today's episode, we will be speaking with John Stevenson, who is Senior Vice President of Global Software for Stratasys. Hello, John. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. And of course, we have Dave Opsall, Vice President of Corporate Development for Techsoft 3D. Hi, Dave. Welcome back. Hi. Thanks. Good to be back. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about collaboration and online communities. And um, we haven't talked too much about that in the past shows. So really excited to, to dig deep into this. So why don't we just go ahead and get started. And John, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you landed initially at GrabCAD. And then maybe you could talk a little bit about how GrabCAD is not a part, now a part of Stratasys. Okay. Well, a little bit about myself. I'm a mechanical engineer by training. And I've been in the mechanical CAD world for more than 30 years. I started as a programmer at what was Unigraphics back in the early 80s, now part of Siemens PLM. I was the managing director of Shape Data over in Cambridge, England in the mid-90s, where we developed the parasolid solid modeling kernel, the first commercial modeling kernel, the kernel that's used in SolidWorks, Onshape, Siemens NX, and lots of other CAD systems. And then I was the executive VP for the CAD business at PTC, managing the entire CAD business at PTC. And now I'm at Stratasys, the world's largest 3D printing company. So you asked how I ended up at GrabCAD. So you might not be aware of this, but GrabCAD was actually founded in Estonia. And it started as a site for mechanical engineers to share custom CAD files. Engineers often have a need for bespoke CAD files. They want to learn how to use CAD or learn how to design a particular uh, difficult piece of geometry where they want to present their model in the context of an entire product or assembly. And that's how GrabCAD started. Eventually, in early 2012, GrabCAD decided to move to the United States, uh, Boston specifically. And at that time, I invested in GrabCAD, so I was actually a financial backer. Then when we decided to pivot and become a product company, I became intrigued and decided to join full-time to help develop products for mechanical engineers. So that's amazing. So your experience, you've actually seen, not only seen a lot of things change in the CAD world, but participated in making it change. So that's very cool. feel like I'm on, on the line with a bit of a celebrity here. <laughs> uh, yeah, when I started, CAD was 16-bit, and it wasn't even color yet. And it was... Wow. People would consider what we had back then to be pretty prehistoric. <laughs> yeah, we look, I hear Dave laughing in the background. <laughs> I remember seeing some really early versions of, uh, of AutoCAD and, uh, when I was there. Yeah, it's pretty funny to look at it now, considering how far we've come, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this this uh, sharing of files now that sounds simple, but it wasn't always it wasn't very easy because the CAD files are really large in size, right? And so, talk a little bit about you know kind of those initial challenges that people face, and then how it's grown, and then we'll get into some other questions about like just that you know collaboration is something we've been talking about for a long, long time. And, and even though we solve one collaboration challenge, others appear. But talk about initially how file sharing kind of evolved and, and how GrabCAD really solved that problem for the community. Right. So people have always had the need to share design data, either within their enterprise or across enterprises. In this case, GrabCAD started as a site for people to share CAD files as a way of sharing knowledge. But it is a difficult technical problem. CAD files are very big. You need to be able to display them and rotate them in 3D online, which means you have to work with every possible CAD file format. You have to do it securely and you have to do it with pretty good performance in order to 
make the experience satisfying for users. So there were a lot of technical challenges to overcome in right. producing a CAD sharing site. And then you have to find users and <laughs> take advantage of a lot of contemporary technologies like Amazon to get good performance in hosting and then Google search to attract users. We didn't have a sales team or a marketing team. 100% of the GrabCAD community is organically generated. They come to us by searching for CAD files. Wow, that's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about how collaboration has evolved and it's really a lot more than file sharing these days. So how are you seeing people collaborate in the world of digital manufacturing now? I mean, so again, going, going beyond just the file sharing, what, what do you see people doing on the GrabCAD platform now? So after we moved to the United States and built up the GrabCAD community, which by the way is now uh, over 3 million registered members, it's about three and a quarter million registered members. Wow, just, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, and, and it's grown at 4,000 members per day and the growth is actually increasing, not decreasing. And wow. again, all through organic search. After uh, having built the community, we decided to build professional tools for engineers for collaboration and file sharing and simply to ease the process of working with manufacturing partners to produce real products. And that's where Workbench came in. It's an online tool for collaboration and CAD-centric file management. So we like to say that engineering is a team sport. Nobody does it alone. <laughs> and every company has partners and they always have, even going back to the earliest days of the industrial revolution, this isn't new but people are always looking for better approaches to working with their partners. Mm -hmm. Approaches that are easier or allow you to accelerate the manufacturing process or more secure. And that's where Workbench comes in. So we have all of the same uh, barriers to collaboration that people have always had, moving and converting data, communicating requirements, working across time zones. We're simply trying to solve those problems in the online world rather than in the desktop world. And do you find any people that are resistant to doing collaboration this way still in this day? I mean, we're becoming more and more accustomed to, you know, doing things online, even if it's a secure, if there's security needed, but are there still people that are resistant to, to, you know, sharing their, their CAD files online in a community like this? There are some, but it's, Fewer and fewer. There are some that can't right. do it because of company policy or even government regulation. I see. And they just can't do it and they need to use traditional approaches. But now cloud software or online software is assumed to be the default deployment. And data centers are going away. If you roll back 10 years, every company was managing their own internal data center their own server farm, their own storage network. They had large IT departments. They're all going away and being replaced by online solutions. Mm -hmm. and 10 years ago, people weren't allowed to bring their own devices and attach them right. to the or computers or phones. That has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. We even have an acronym for that. <laughs> yeah, the BYOD. BYOD, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So... Everything has changed and online is now the default deployment. There are always going to be some people that simply can't do it for one reason or another, but most of the world is moving towards solutions that are allowed to be online. And, and you see it in every other discipline. Right. You do CRM online with Salesforce, your travel with Concur, right. HR management with success factors. Every other solution is already online. Right, right. And... So collaboration is something that we talk about uh, with TechSoft a lot, and especially with Dave and the 3D PDF solutions and, and how that helps with collaboration. So I'm wondering, can you share more than CAD files on the GrabCAD platform? Uh, is it kind of opened up to different file formats and other types of information, or is it still strictly design files, you know, CAD files and things like that? Um, no, you can share any type of file via the Workbench platform or the GrabCAD community site. Um, there are things we can do with CAD files that are special, view and rotate them in 3D, annotate them online, uh, convert them to other formats, neutral formats or other proprietary CAD formats. 
but you can share any file online. And we can yeah. view some uh, 2D file formats like PDF or uh, DWG, but our specialty is really 3D CAD. Got it. And Dave, let's get your thoughts on how collaboration has evolved over the years, especially going online and using new technologies. What if, I mean, you've been in around just as long as I think John has, if I'm not mistaken. So what are, what are, what have you observed over the last 30 years as collaboration has evolved? Well, my, my experience is, you know, pretty similar to John's in, in, in terms of watching how it's evolved over time. I was thinking back as he was talking about a startup that we put together back in 1999 called iEngineer that was trying to accomplish a lot of the same things, but you you didn't have, there wasn't really a notion of community then, which mm. I think is a critical part of this. And the technologies that have enabled communities to come together really weren't available. They didn't exist back then. You didn't have mobile apps. You didn't have the kind of bandwidth that we have available today. And it's, it's amazing to see how it's accelerated the pace of collaboration. You know, sometimes you know, we forget about the fact that, you know, a lot of those activities in the traditional ways took a long time to accomplish uh, mm -hmm. for one reason or another. And today now it's the speed, the velocity of collaboration is really what's impressive, you know, to me, I think. Right. And that's actually a good point and a good transition into our next topic. When you talk about, you know, being able, the velocity of how things evolve and being able to do things faster, talking about some of the new challenges that people face as collaboration technologies have become a lot more sophisticated and continue to get more sophisticated, that now there's a whole new set of challenges. And so, John, I don't know if you want to take this one first, but in your view, what are some of those new challenges? And I think the pressure to do things faster is probably one of them, but I'll let you kind of outline what your thoughts are. Right. Um, you know, those pressures have always existed. The pressures to do things faster, to work across time zones, to work with manufacturing partners that might be in China or Vietnam or in Mexico. And there are new solutions to those problems. A, a new challenge that I've seen, though, is that we're undergoing a hardware renaissance in the United States and elsewhere. And there are a lot of people designing and trying to produce products that have never done manufacturing before. And even big names, companies like Google and Snapchat, who you wouldn't think of being hardware companies, are producing hardware. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that are simply new to the manufacturing world that have to learn how to do this from scratch. And vendors like us and others have to support them and make them successful. Which is interesting. And I guess maybe because the iteration process of trying to develop a piece of hardware can go faster. We can fail faster, right, and figure out where you need to go in order to make it better. Or maybe you just abandon it and like, oh, that was a cool idea, but that's really not going to work, right? Because, I mean, with, with Snapchat, the whole video sharing sunglasses thing, that just blew my mind when I found out about that. It, again, like you said, would never in a million years have thought that Snapchat would want to get into the hardware game. But do you think that it's going to become something that, everybody gets into like you know because there's the pressure for there's iot there's cloud there's mobile 3d printing and and manufacturers are looking at all these things going which one do i do which which one should i do and how do i evaluate for my business do i need to come up with a device a hard piece of hardware so how how have you found that maybe companies are navigating this well, new trend or this challenge well hardware is cool again and it had been a long time before hardware that had become cool. So just like in software where lots of tools came out in the mid nineties with the windows platform. And then in uh, 2010 with AWS developing software products became much cheaper than it used to be. Mm -hmm. This thing is going to happen with hardware. There'll be component technologies and standard approaches that allow people to get to market quicker with hardware because there's a demand for that. There's a demand for hardware and a demand for speeding up time to market. Mm -hmm. So the same thing's going to happen on the hardware side. Dave, any any thoughts on this one, the hardware angle? No, I, I completely agree. You know, the, the barriers to getting a product to market have become so low in many cases now that what John's describing is something you see quite a bit of. The companies that we talk to when we license component technology, many of them are companies like 
like the ones that enable those sorts of services, a place where you could take something from, uh, you've collaborated with somebody on GrabCAD and send it to a company like Fictive or someone that would actually be able to, you know, give you a bid back to produce that part in a matter mm-hmm. of 24 hours. So you've got this velocity element to it. You've got the uh, reduction in the barrier to, to entry because the person designing doesn't have to worry about tooling up. You know, that's, you know, the capital, the, the capital budget side of his equation is, you know, mm-hmm. completely different than what it was say 20 years ago. And so I, I think, I think John's right. It's it's going to be a hardware renaissance, and we're going to see we're going to see products that you you talked about the you know the Snapchat device. The, we're going to keep seeing products that people didn't even imagine could be produced five mm-hmm. years ago. Right. So, do either of you have advice for manufacturers who are seeing this happen and and are starting to think, okay, should I be coming up with my own device? Should I be? How how would you counsel? Perhaps maybe one of the smaller manufacturers. I mean, the larger team, the larger guys are going to have whole teams of people looking at this, right? But for the smaller guys who are, you know, trying to stay competitive and maybe said, you know, I just got into cloud. Now I've got to, now I have to create my own piece of hardware. What do I do? How would you counsel some of those guys? John, do you want to, you want to take that one first or you want me to? Yeah, I can take, yeah, I'd like to hear your answer first, Dave. And I have some. <laughs> Well, I think my observation is is that the, it's the small, smaller companies that have taken to a lot of these new platforms and new capabilities in a, in a pretty aggressive way. It's, it's helped them become a lot more competitive. And the folks that I think might need some advice are the larger companies where either they have policies that prevent them from exploring mm-hmm. how they could use some of these new technologies. Or, you know, in some cases, they're in a business like John was mentioning, if you're producing you know, ITAR parts or something like that, that are government controlled, you don't have a lot of options in terms of how you do that. But a lot of other companies don't have that concern. And, you know, they they need to stop worrying as much as they have about, you know, intellectual property risks, not because it's not important, but because the technology is there to keep it secure. So Mm -hmm. uh, they need to start exploring those new platforms and figuring out exactly what business benefit can I get from those. But I think the smaller folks being more agile and more nimble are not the ones that are going to have difficulty taking this stuff on. Interesting. That's- okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I would say, though, that it is still a challenge for any newcomer to manufacturing because you need to be successful at every scale. You have to be able to produce the prototype cheaply, the beta devices cheaply, then your first production units and eventually manufacturing at scale. So you have to succeed at every step of the journey. So I would suggest that if you're new to manufacturing, that you find partners that are dedicated to making people like yourselves successful Mm -hmm. for the entire path. Now that's a good point for, because for example, prototyping 3d printing is much more popular now, right? And a lot more people are doing, but it's still tough to do, right? It's still, if you're not an expert in it to get it right, you know, what material do you use? How big should you, you know, that kind of thing. Can we talk a little bit about that as well? Because I know in in a previous conversation, uh, you had brought up that 3D printing is also one of the challenges now to collaboration. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, that's right. 3D printing is becoming tremendously popular. It's, it's moving from rapid prototyping to manufacturing of end use parts today. There are Mm -hmm. 3D printed parts flying on uh, Airbus and Boeing aircraft already, but it is a challenge. And we're writing software today, a a product called GrabCAD Print that is designed to make 3D printing easy and efficient for uh, mechanical engineers so that they can increase their success rate and learn how to 3D print successfully. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of technology challenges. How do you pick the right materials? Which 3D printing technology should you use? Which printer should I buy? Should I buy a printer or should I use a service bureau? And until you've gone down that path, you have to figure out solutions or answers to all of those questions. And so, no, absolutely. And I've actually even had some personal experience with trying to figure out the 3D printing game and size of things and materials of things. And I know that the 3MF is now out there, this new 3D printing standard. Has that helped things? Do you think that things like that will continue to uh, present themselves that will 
streamline the 3D printing process for people because there are so many different options? I, well, I'm of two minds on this topic. I think 3MF will help. It's an evolving standard. It's uh, the community and committees defining, de defining 3MF are populated by serious individuals from big companies like Siemens and Autodesk, PTC, and others. Uh, so it is a very serious effort to define a standard for 3D printing. And I think it will help because it will connect applications and 3D printers without those companies having to work with each other directly. So you'll be able to print the same way that you can print in the 2D world and it will happen automatically. But I think for real manufacturing, additive manufacturing is going to look a lot like traditional subtractive manufacturing where more information is encapsulated in the CAD file in the form of PMI or mm -hmm. standards like STEP, JT, or 3D PDF. And those will be the transport mechanisms for real PMI information for real manufacturing. Makes sense. Dave, any additional comments on that? Yeah, no, I've, I, I agree. There's also, I think, going to be two-part processes where you've got a part that's, you know, being developed partly with additive manufacturing, partly with subtractive manufacturing. That PMI information becomes extremely critical when you're trying to build a part in that way. And, you know, 3MF is not addressing, you know, that it's, that's not what its its role is. So you're going to have to see some of these standards cooperate with each other, mm -hmm. uh, you know, down the road to affect a complete communication of the design intent, I think. Yeah, I, I, for sure. It's going to be something that's, uh, that's evolving and we'll just have to do another podcast uh, as, <laughs> and to follow it along to see how it evolves. So let's touch on that last thing that we, the last challenge that we've already mentioned once and already in this podcast, but we'll do just another few seconds of deep dive. And that's the, the pressure to do things a little faster. And sometimes at least for me, it's like, it's at some point it's going to, it starts to feel like you're trying to squeeze blood from a rock. Like how much faster can things get and how much shorter can cycle times get? And I know John, you had some, some thoughts on that that I thought were pretty interesting. So talk about that as one of the new challenges for collaboration. Well, actually I think things can get a lot faster. It might feel at any point in time, like we're squeezing blood from a rock, but things <laughs> faster and more efficient. On the software side, through continuous integration and concepts like DevOps, people are now releasing software multiple times per day, not on a six month release cycle or an 18 month release cycle, but literally multiple times per day. We update the GrabCAD community sometimes 12 times in a day. Wow. And, and there'll be process improvements on the hardware side that enable similar things. It won't take a day because you're manufacturing physical products, but things are going to get a lot faster on the hardware side through analogous concepts. Dave, <laughs> your thoughts? <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm just a little shocked right now. <laughs> yeah. well, I, let me give you one real example. Uh, people use our printers today to print molds for injection molding. And we have materials that are suitable for injection molding. And by doing that, they can take a CAD model and they can design the molds and print them in 24 hours and then do their first run of 100 or 200 injection molded parts. Whereas creating a tool made out of metal, having to cut an actual tool takes four to six weeks and can cost $40,000 or even $150,000. So that's a dramatic uh, time savings going from six weeks to 24 hours is a pretty big deal for your first run. Of yeah. I, I think the pressure to go faster has been there for, for ever? as long as people have been making things. <laughs> right. uh, I don't, I don't think that's ever going to change. And I think what happens is that other than truly disruptive innovations, like additive manufacturing, I think has been one of those. What, what, what tends to happen is, is that the, 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 the things that, that are not really part of the real innovation cycle get automated. And, you know, that the, the benefit of that is it's giving people more time to, to enable innovation, to do the kind of things that, you know, for instance, engineers really like doing and getting rid of some of the things that, uh, 
you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them drudgery, but there, there are things that, you know, are repetitive that don't really add any mm-hmm. value from an innovation standpoint. And so I, I'm, I'm excited to see that pressure continue because I, I think it makes, I think it makes for better products. I think it makes for healthier markets. So I, I'm hoping it speeds up. I don't feel like it's blood from a rock, but sometimes I feel like I'm running to catch up. <laughs> no, I, think right. Dave, I think Dave's exactly right. It's all about allowing engineers to spend time where they're actually adding value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More, the more of that we can do, the better, the better, the better the industry will be. No, I mean, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, for me, it's, it's maybe I just, uh, the blood from a rock thing, I just, you know, sometimes feeling that pressure is just, it seems impossible sometimes, but then you do see improvement and then, and then it encourages you to keep, keep uh, innovating and keep going forward. But well, we have reached our time and with every guest, we like to wrap up our podcast with a challenge to our listeners. Uh, you can leave them a piece of advice or maybe give them a challenge, you know, after listening, go out and do this. So, uh, John, what would be your, your challenge or your advice to our listeners today? Boy, I, I think what I'd like to challenge the listeners to do is to become more involved in the engineering communities in which they work, whether it's online at a site like GradCAD or in person at local meetups or mm-hmm. user meetings. And they can share their skills and knowledge, host meetups, and allow rising engineers to learn more about design and manufacturing and bring the next generation of engineers into the process. That's an excellent challenge because you actually don't even have to be an engineer to do that, right? But just be no, interested in the topic and interested in innovation. So that's, uh, I like that. Very nice. Well, thank you very much, John, for joining us. Uh, I think it was a great conversation, and I hope our listeners found it useful um, and informative. I know I did. And uh, thank you, Dave, as always, for for being here. My pleasure. And uh, thanks, everybody out there, for listening. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, please do. And write us a review on iTunes. That will help people find the Beyond 3D podcast much, much easier. And of course, share it with your colleagues and friends and family, anybody interested in, in learning about uh, where 3D data is going and those kinds of innovations. So thanks again, John and Dave. Thanks, everybody out there. And until next time, uh, have a great day. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thank you for joining us on the Beyond 3D podcast, hosted by TechSoft 3D. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review or subscribe on SoundCloud. To listen to past episodes or learn more about TechSoft 3D, visit www.techsoft3d.com forward slash blog. Send us comments and suggestions at info at techsoft3d.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again on the next episode of Beyond 3D.